Hello. Hey. How are you this beautiful Sunday morning? Good. Um, I really don't have any announcements in here just about the school starting, so just be aware of the kids running around. Are there any other announcements that the congregation has? Okay, we'll go right into the responsive call to worship. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Lord, we come to you this day with so many things going on in our lives. Some of these things are wonderful and cause us to rejoice. However, there's far too many things that has caused us fear and anxiety. Humbly we wait for your presence with us. We need your healing touch. Feed us with the bread of life that we may no hunger no more. Strengthen us to do your will, for it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening hymn is, I Call... O oh Lord, on you. Page number 674, verses 1, 2, and 4. Thank you, Paige. That was beautiful. We'll do the reading, Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 through 13, page 829 in the Pew Bible. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign you're coming in the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and they will lead many astray, and you will hear the wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but in the end it is not. For nations will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdoms, and there will be many fam famines and earth earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be 
hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many of you will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Second reading is from Luke chapter 12, verse 1 through 8, page 871. In the meantime, when so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples first, Beware of leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have saved nothing more than they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten, forgotten before God. Why even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the son of man, also will acknowledge me before the angels of God. And the third reading is Hebrew. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 to 38, page 1007. But I recall the former days when you were enlightened. You endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach the affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Since you knew that, that yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have a need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteousness, one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my... I am hoping that today is not like the last time I was here. I preached on servant leadership, and then, as you all know, driving home, there was the news bulletin that President Biden was not going to run for re-election. And I was like, that's God's timing, but... I had nothing to do with it. I don't think that um, what I share today will have that same impact. But then, when it comes to the Lord, I know better than to argue. That passage in Hebrews... Do not abandon your confidence. Wow. That's a strong statement. But what does it mean? Well, I'll be honest. It had me kind of thrown for a loop. So I went to the number one Bible commentary that I always use. A dictionary. You know, I went to three years of seminary, and the most important thing I learned was if you can't figure out what it means in English, don't even think about going to the other languages. Have a dictionary. Boy, that makes a lot of sense. And let me tell you, dictionaries are a whole lot cheaper than some of those textbooks I had to buy in seminary. Confidence. Do not abandon your confidence, says the writer. Well, 
what does confidence mean? Our dictionary says it's a feeling or conscience, consciousness of one's power of, or a reliance on one's circumstances. A faith or belief that one will act in a proper or effective way. The quality or state of being. I am certain of this. A relation of trust or intimacy. Of course, then we have the adjective that's used in such terms as confidence men and confidence schemes. You know about those. Hey, buddy, I can give you such a deal on the Brooklyn Bridge. And we've all met people with schemes like that. The other day, knock came at the door. Young fella, he goes, I was just looking at your car, and I see that you have hail damage. And I represent, he named some auto body shop on the other side of town. He says, I represent this company, and we will fix that for free and charge your insurance, and it'll be nothing more. Now, my wife and I park our cars back from the road for the guy to see if we had any hail damage at all. He was trespassing on our property. And the more he talked, the more I'm hearing, snow job. Thank you, but no thank you. And please don't bother my neighbors. Yeah, that's the kind of confidence we run into more than we like to admit. There's always some guy calling on the phone. You've got hail damage on your roof, and we can replace it. Oh, brother. Yes, we know the negative context for confidence. But we also know the positive aspects to the extent sometimes we take them for granted. Now, any way that you drive out of Taylorville, you're going to cross bridges. Central Illinois is just full of those little creeks and rivulets and rivers. And every bridge we cross has maximum weight limit. We don't think about that. We just zip right across. We have confidence that those bridges will hold up. We do, don't we? When Mona and I were first married, in seminary, often on a weekend we'd go out and drive some of the back roads through nature in central Kentucky. And I'll never forget, we were driving down in the Kentucky River Palisades. That's where the land is way up here. And the river's way down there. And you have these zigzag roads down to the river. And we came to this one wooden bridge. Suggested weight, five tons. Now, Mona had a sunbird. Now, you, if you remember the Pontiac sunbirds, they're not much bigger than one of these pews. And she's like, get out of the car. <laughs> Why? Because I don't think this car will make it across that bridge. Mona, I can guarantee you, this bridge will hold this car. This is not a five-ton car. Get out of the car. Walk across the bridge. I walked across the bridge. Now, 
In this rural part of Kentucky, there's not much traffic. But wouldn't you know it, I'm walking across the bridge, three other cars show up. And their drivers are looking at me like, you know, there's a mental institution just about 20 miles up the road. And then Mona drives across it at five miles an hour. Get back in the car. I told you it holds us. Well, I wasn't sure. Please understand, I love my wife dearly, and I'm not trying to make fun of her. But she did not have confidence in that wood bridge. And considering the number of dead trees around the bridge that were full of termite holes, mm, she might have had, a, had some good reason. I told that story in one church once, and afterwards, a husband walked up to me and he goes, you too? His story was from New York State, but we're called to have confidence in our Lord Jesus Christ. And the writer says, do not abandon your confidence. Well, why would the writer say that? Well, I think part of the reason is because he had, this writer had seen people who did abandon their confidence. And no doubt, he was upset about it. So how is it that we can go through life and not abandon our confidence? It's easier said than done, but how do we do it? Our scripture lessons today point out three things that will help us not abandon our confidence in Jesus Christ. In Matthew, we're reminded that we need to be true to Jesus and his teachings. Now, this section here is right after the triumphal entry. Jesus is sitting in the temple courts and he's teaching the people and He's discussing the law with the scribes and Pharisees, and they're trying to trip him up. And guess what? They can't do it. So after a while, Jesus leaves the temple, and they're now up on the Mount of Olives. And they're Seated on the hillside, they can look down over the Kidron Valley and up the hill to where the temple is and see all the beauty of Jerusalem. <coughs> and the disciples say, well, now, when are you going to set up this kingdom you're talking about? We don't like these Roman governors. We don't like this emperor." We don't like all these soldiers. When are you going to clean house? And Jesus said, well, first off, you've got to remember, don't be led astray. There are signs that you will see, and you will know when it's the end of the age. But don't be led astray. Beware of false messiahs and false leaders. Now, in the time leading up to when Jesus began his ministry, there had already been false messiahs. If you didn't believe it, all you had to do was walk outside of Jerusalem. They were all hanging on crosses, stretching for miles. And the Romans weren't real good about taking down dead bodies, so it was not a pretty sight. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And if you think there have already been some, there's more to come. So be aware. And there's going to be talk of wars and rumors of wars. And it's going to happen again and again and again. But don't be alarmed. I'm warning you about this. There's going to be political upheavals. Natural disasters. And this is only the beginning. <coughs> Excuse me. Did I eat that onion? Oh, I'm sorry, that's another joke. Jesus says, all these things are going to be happy, but I want you to endure for me. Because there's going to be persecutions. And because of that, people will fall away. Whether they're weak or cowardly, they have fear, or they betray others. There will be false prophets. And an increase in lawlessness. But you are to endure because Jesus gives you the inner and outer strength. I was talking with a friend last week. And we were talking about the fact that in the early church, when people decided to follow Christ, they were often persecuted and they were warned about it. And yet they continued to follow. And I said, well, you know, Jesus is the prescription to deal with our sins. But just like any prescription, you know, the small print says there are side effects. Back 10, 15 years ago, one of the doctors I go to said, hey, they've got this new drug to combat diabetes. You ought to take it. It was called Actos. And you know what? I took it, and my blood sugar readings were fabulous. My A1C was right where it was supposed to be. I was so excited. I didn't read the side effects. The side effect was it makes you retain fluid. And I ballooned up to 286 pounds. That's not good. Especially for a guy who likes to wear suits. All of a sudden, I couldn't button my vests. And, you know, every home has one. Someone who takes a look at your wardrobe and tells you if you're passable to leave the house. You can't button that. It's too small. You need to find something else to wear. Yes, dear. And then there was the ads. If you've been taking Actos and have discovered that you've come down with cancer, call the law offices of... Uh, like, what else do I need? So I talked to the doctor, and the doctor said, yeah, this is, maybe it's not the best that you not take this anymore. You know what? I stopped taking it and the side effects stopped. I dropped 30 pounds in a month. I can live like that. My belts couldn't. I had to invest in suspenders. But the drug had side effects. When we follow Jesus Christ, There's side effects. Not everyone will be happy for us. Not everyone will honor us. 
And Jesus says, be aware of this. Endure. I will give you strength. Well then, we look at the passage in Luke. Jesus says, if you are to endure, you also must acknowledge. You must acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Jesus has been teaching the people, and once again the Pharisees are trying to trip him up. And there's such a crowd, they're stepping on each other. The only thing I can compare this to is a political rally. Back, <clears throat> oh my goodness, 40 years ago, I was pastoring in Northwest Ohio, and Ronald Reagan decided to do a whistle stop campaign. And they came through a town about 10 miles away from where I was pastoring. So Mona and I went down to the train station to hear him. And I mean, that crowd was immense. And there was this spot where no one was standing. I thought, great, we can get up close. Nobody's standing in this spot. Come to find out, it was a sinkhole. And it was about a foot deep. And I stepped into it, and now I was on the level with all the people around me. Remember, Mona's 5'3". She's like, well, that was smart. Yes, dear. Please, understand. I'm not trying to rag on my wife, okay? It was just, that was what happened that day. But I understand about crowds. They want to get close. They want to hear. And they're stepping on each other, and, you know, oh, excuse me, pardon me. It's a mess. And in the middle of this, Jesus pulls the disciples aside and gives them some extra words of instruction. He reminds them that nothing is hidden from God. You know, I don't think that the uh, publicity people got the message on that. How many times have you turned on the TV and seen the ad, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas? And the Lord God is saying, uh-uh, no, it doesn't. You see, nothing's hidden from God. So don't be a hypocrite. And he's picking on the Pharisees there. Secrets will become known. Whispers will be proclaimed. Nothing is hidden from God. And we have to answer for those things. But then Jesus turns it around and he says, but God values you. We live in a day and age when people are not valued. And yet Jesus proclaims, God values you. Don't fear what other people say or do. Fear spiritual powers. Fear the devil. If you get killed, nobody can touch you after you're dead. Except the devil except Jesus. There is a contrast between worldly values and godly values. Sparrows are sold five for a dollar. Are you not of much more value than them? God cares for these little animals. How much more he cares for you to the extent he knows how many hairs 
you have on your head. Mine are getting fewer. Every day in the comb, I see some that are no longer connected. But that is the way God works. He knows us intimately. You are of value. Now that's important words because in Jesus' time, when armies fought, if the soldiers died, they just left them there. There wasn't a group that came around and buried the dead. They just left them there. And Jesus says, you are of value. So, because of that, <clears throat> acknowledge God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for what he has done for you. And God will acknowledge you before the angels in heaven. <coughs> That's confidence when you acknowledge God before others. And then Hebrews ties this all up in a nice, pretty bow. My wife is going to a uh, wedding shower this afternoon, and I spent yesterday wrapping presents and getting the bow just right. So, the writer to the Hebrews then ties this package up by saying that we are to do the will of God. The writer is giving exhortations and warnings to the new Christians. And he points out when you were first enlightened, when you first began following Jesus Christ, it wasn't easy. There were people that were against what you were doing. I'll never forget, one of my church members asked me years ago to go visit her son. She was all upset because he was a closet alcoholic, never admitted it to anyone. And when he finally came to himself, he went to a rehabilitation center. She was so upset because he had pulled the wool over her eyes. So I went to visit him. I had to go to AA meetings in order to get in the building, and I think it was the second or third time I visited him, and he was just feeling lower than the table. And I said to him, I said, what's wrong? He said, well, this last week I was reading my Bible, and I recommitted my life to Christ. And I'm going to live different from now on. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, but I told my counselor. What do you mean? Well, I told my counselor that I had uh, reaffirmed my faith in Jesus Christ. I said, I'm sure he was happy for you. No, he told me I shouldn't get all wrapped up in this religion stuff. I was not happy. I don't know who that counselor is, but I hope he's changed his tune or he's going to have to answer. But here was this young man who was trying 
to get his life back together. And he had asked Jesus into his heart to help him. And for this counselor to say, oh, don't get too wrapped up in that. That was persecution. And the writer says, these things happen, but don't give up. Be compassionate to others who are going through similar things. Yes, you have been through a lot. You've lost possessions. You may have been in prison, but don't give up. Don't abandon your confidence. Endure. And the writer quotes from Isaiah 26.20 and from Habakkuk 2, verses 3 and 4. In a little while, the one who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. My soul takes no pleasure in anyone who shrinks back. The just shall live by faith. That's one of the hallmarks of the Protestant Reformation. We live by faith. It's a confident faith. And we are called. We are called to be true to Jesus. To acknowledge him before others. And never forget that he sees what all is happening around us. As some of you know, I like to read church history, and uh, I was reading this week about two saints of the church from the, oh, about 250 A.D. The emperor at that time was Decius, and he was not a nice man, and he hated Christians with a passion. And he thought there was nothing better than killing them. Because, you see, they wouldn't worship him. The Roman emperors had a, how do I want to say this? Had an ego problem. They considered themselves gods. And the Christian says, no, you're just a human like us. And we're not going to worship you. So that made them enemies of the state, traitors. And for every Christian they killed, it seemed like more sprang up. And the story is told of a Christian by the name of Lawrence. He was sentenced to death for his faith and the guard who was taking him to his death was a Christian by the name of Hippolytus. And Hippolytus said, Lawrence, I can't take you to your uh, death. I belong there just as much as you, if not more. And Lawrence said to him, no, God wants you to stay here. You have more work to do. And Lawrence went to his death. It was a very gruesome death. And Hippolytus, who was captain of the guard, went back to the emperor and publicly proclaimed to him, you've killed a Christian, but I'm a Christian too. And my confidence is in our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, needless to say, Hippolytus was seized, tortured, and killed. And on the day that he was killed, a few towns away, there was a fellow by the name of Cassian, who was a school teacher. 
and was teaching the children how to read and write, and as he did it, he was also teaching them about the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the area governor found out, and Cassian suffered a horrible martyr's death. But these two gentlemen never lost their confidence that they would see their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And their stories are brought down to us to remind us that we, too, have that confidence. Times may be tough, and they may get tougher. But God gives us confidence. He values us. He gives us strength. His presence is with us. So that means we can go forth in his power. And whatever comes our way, Jesus is with us and we can continue on. Yes, it's easier to give up. But we are called to endure as our Lord Jesus Christ endured for us. And all we have to to do is ask God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to give us that strength so that we can maintain our confidence in him. That's our good news for today. Let's pray. Oh, Lord. Oh, how many times we see the problems in our world and the times that we feel like we should give up. But you are our, our confidence and strength and we ask that you would never depart from us and give us your strength and your victory today and in the days ahead. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue in worship by singing hymn number 634. Let's stand as we sing. Mm -hmm. 